first time I had wild rice. Now, if you do not get out of my face, Benjamin, thank you. Real wild rice. Manomen, the good berry in Anishinaabe Moen, and Psin in Dakota. The first time I had it, my mind was blown that a delicious grain like this was just growing happily here in the Midwest. It was literally so good. The Anishinaabe, upon being given a prophecy to leave the Northeast and go to a place where food grew on the water, got to the Great Lakes and were like, this has got to be the foretold food because it's delicious, nutritious, and it's everywhere. I had never been ricing before. I live here, <laughs> where Manoman's cousin, Southern wild rice, Zazania aquatica, is on the threatened list. And thus, we don't have a permit system for harvest, which some upper Midwest states like Minnesota do. Which is why my newly purchased out of state or permit and I got on a 5 a.m. flight to the Twin Cities to meet up with one Sam Fair. Sam's a critically acclaimed wild food writer, forager, and all around great guy. And he's gonna take me ricing for the first time. Pending I don't flip the canoe, which hopefully I won't cause I was a river lifeguard for four years and that would be very embarrassing for me. Ricing is an example of indigenous agricultural science. Uh, nay, agricultural genius. First, you locate a large patch of wild rice. Northern wild rice loves freshwater creeks, rivers and lake edges and southern wild rice is much the same except it can tolerate brackish water letting it grow closer to the ocean then it's time to take to the water in a canoe there are two jobs one who pulls right, well and one who knocks pulling is using a long stick to maneuver through the rice bed with more accuracy than a paddle show them the biden's that's making us not, yeah, not this, the president not the president this biden's <laughs> that's making it hard for us to move around right now. And you do it while standing. You've got to have a mad balance, which is why I am the one who knocks. Knocking is the one-two motion of leaning several plants over the canoe with one stick, and then using the vibrations of running the second stick over the stalks to knock the grains off and into the boat. The agricultural genius lies in this action, because while you catch most of the grains, a few will always fall into the water, effectively seeding the bed for the following rice season. Northern and Southern wild rice, along with several other forage grain crops like African wild rice, shatter, which means the grains fall off really easily. While their Asian counterparts were bred to shatter less, many global indigenous cultures worked with that aspect of the rice, developing similar strategies to knocking so you would both harvest and plant in one move. You also see this in the Western US with our native rice grasses, except it was gathered on foot and not into baskets, not canoes. Sorry, while putting this together, I imagined the slight but not impossible possibility that hundreds of years ago, my indigenous ancestors in the Southeast US introduced one of my newly arrived African ancestors to Southern wild rice and I don't know, maybe my African ancestor felt a little more at home having met a similar plant that's gathered in a similar way to wild rice back home. Maybe it fostered some level of friendship or camaraderie or feeling of safety. And now I'm crying, so give me a second. Okay, so now you have a canoe full of rice. Now what? It's time for processing. Traditionally, the newly gathered rice is left out to dry, but I only had a couple days up north and we suspected that parching the rice green could still have great results. Parching is keeping the grains constantly moving in a copper or iron cauldron so the last bit of moisture cooks off and the papery coverings on the rice grains dehydrate, making them easier to remove. The way I would have Michelle Obama arms if I was doing this all the time every fall. You can't tell right here, but my right shoulder is on a fire, moving the 17 pounds of green rice. But thankfully it gets lighter as you part. Next was the part I was the most excited for. This is me fueling up for it with apples from Sam's orchard. It is time to dance the rice, which is exactly what it sounds like. Sam has these amazing buckskin moccasins from a local Anishinaabe craftsman, and they are perfect for not getting stabbed a bajillion times by the rice while you dance it. The dancing for which a hip moment is a requirement. I would never do the elliptical at the gym again if I was dancing rice frequently. Every now and then just change positions so that it doesn't like find a little crevice where it hides and doesn't get. Yeah, much more exhausting than the stirring and the ricing. Rubs the grains together under your feet, essentially turning their papery covering to dust. The move kind of reminds me of my Cape Verdean aunties and uncles dancing when I was little. Rice dust. Once the papery grain covers have been pulverized by the dance, it's time to winnow the dust away. Pouring the rice back and forth with a nice breeze, and sometimes that breeze is provided by a box fan, gets rid of the gritty dust that you would not want to put 
into your mouth hole. And here's our rice. I cannot believe that I helped do this. I know that some folks can get like hundreds of pounds in a day, but I'm so proud of the four quarts of finished rice we ended up with. The green parched rice was fluffier and nutty and it felt like maybe it cooks a little faster. If you wanna try real wild rice for yourself, several native bands like the White Earth Nation sell hand harvested and parched rice. And they even granted rice its own personhood. So lawsuits could be filed on the rice's behalf when its habitat is put at risk by pollution or by development. But my hope for your heart is that someday you get to see this amazing plant in person and relish in a tradition that was held onto even through colonization. Thank you, Sam, for taking me ricing. And thank you to all of the indigenous groups who keep ricing alive. Maybe one day I'll live to see a world in which the waters are clean enough and the grains are bountiful enough that we can rice here in Ohio. Happy snacking. Don't die. Not the TSA pulling my bag like they always do after I've been foraging. And not the TSA agent telling me how to cook the wild rice. I said I wanted to try making wild rice crispy treats and he's like, wild rice doesn't work well sweet. And I was like, pardon me. Am I, are we gonna pull you over? Or are we just, are we just fucking with you? Could you do your best to not fuck with black people though? For real? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be demeaning or like, you know, a capture. Just, I, I really need you to understand that like, that is really, really, really triggering. Like this whole video, like I was just casually scrolling and you even talking about this was probably one of the most triggering things ever. And um, I'm not trying to be like overly sensitive or some shit. It's just that I've been pulled over like so many times in my life like a number that if i told you the number it wouldn't make any fucking sense like you'd be like that's weird and um if i told you the amount of tickets that i actually got from those times i got pulled over the ratio doesn't make any fucking sense um like i got pulled over so many times in high school that i knew the police officers who were pulling me over and they just kept doing it. They'd be like, oh yeah, David from the, you went to the Christian school, so you're, you're one of the good ones type shit. Do you know what I mean? Like I knew the cops so well that one time I snuck out of the house when I was a kid and I got a flat tire and the tire jack didn't fit on the truck. And one of these cops stayed with me and helped me like change this tire <laughs> for hours. Uh, like, like, I think it was like an hour and a half in the freezing cold in winter. Um, because he knew me so well for pulling me over so much. Do you know what I mean? And, and you know, props to him. But, but when you do shit like this, you got to understand, man, like. <laughs> when I get pulled over, when most black people get pulled over, we got like a whole protocol that happens. Like there's an entire sort of set of things. Just that the sniff, the whiff of somebody like thinking about pulling us over, right? Cop gets behind you, you're immediately running. You're running scenarios, right? You're running, is my, are my tags good? I know I got ADHD. Is, a, is there a lighter in the car? Does the car smell like anything? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, and so when you do this, like, it's not, <laughs> it's not like a chill Tuesday for some people. Do you know what I mean? It's not like, oh no, like the people who are gonna be the most affected by this. I'm just asking as a favor, man. Please, like, if you could just make it. I know you. I know you're just doing your job. I know you just work there. Um. But fuck, man. I remember this one time I thought I was about to get pulled over, and this cop was riding behind me for some blocks, and. You know, I'm doing this stuff. I'm looking for like a 7-Eleven to pull into so I can get out of the car really quick and be like, I'm not the George you're looking for type shit. And I was already almost home. So I was like, let me just get home. At least I'll be home. Um, and so he ends up turning off uh, and not not pulling me over. And I remember when I got home, I pulled into the front and I remember checking in with myself because I think subconsciously I expected myself to be a lot more rattled than I was, even though I was a little rattled. Um, and my body was in this like almost weird state of calm, like absolute just stillness, right? Because that's the sort of trigger response to having a cop do some shit like that to you. You know, like, cause that's my trigger response is to like go into complete, like I'm locked in, right? I'm present, 
yes, so nurse, no sir type shit. Like I'm not gonna cause any kind of fucking problems. You know what I'm saying? And and then I surprised myself because I started crying because I was really angry <laughs> at the unfairness that the mere sight of a cop um, creates that response within me. I was just really, I was. I think it all kind of hit me at once. You know what I mean? And so just from person to person, right? Um, could you just really make an effort to not do this to black people? Because it really, it really, it really could fuck up their day. Like it could, it could really fuck their shit up. Thank you. It's so funny because it's like, I'm definitely one person, right? But like, it's almost like I have a relationship with my altered states, you know? Um, like, sometimes, like, sleepy me um, will, like, leave me little notes uh, because I, I, like, tend to get really forgetful when I'm tired. So, like, I'll leave myself little notes, but I'll leave them almost like I'm leaving notes for a friend with, like, little, like, pictures and smiley faces on them and things. And it's, like, sober me and drunk me have a well, we have an okay relationship. It's a little contentious. It's got better over the years. But like sober me and high me have a good relationship. Also, one of my favorite things about being super forgetful is that like I'll go into my notes and like write little jokes or poems or just like silly little notes and things. And then I'll go back in there later and it's like a total surprise. Like I had no idea that was even in there and I wrote that. Isn't it super annoying that like your YouTube will just make playlists sometimes? You yeah, know, like, like your YouTube account will just sometimes like create a random playlist for you. Does that not happen? Cause I have playlists on there that I swear I didn't make, like full of songs and videos and stuff that like I don't like. It's no, it's like the same thing as like um like the Apple Music. For some reason, it'll like make playlists for you, like make music playlists. Yours doesn't do that. What do you mean? No, I swear, my that's just a thing my phone does. I don't know. I've just been really struggling with my faith lately. It's, it's. It's so strange. It's like most of the time I have a fairly consistent uh, set of religious beliefs, but at the same time, there's like pockets of my brain that are just like believe different things entirely. Oh yeah, no, I, my voice changes all the time. No, it's, um, I'm just like, I'm a theater kid. You know, I come from like a loud, rowdy family. Uh, it's, I think it might be an autism thing. I can't really, I can't really control it, um, and sometimes I'll do a little character voice for a bit and I'll just get stuck. I don't know. So my friend has this cat who, um, they warned me when I met them, does not like men, um, and it's so straight, it's, it's almost like the cat can tell how aggressively gender fluid I am, because on days when I'm especially in, like, man mode, it's like I'm gender fluid, but in a way where it's like, like my entire mental, my entire worldview, the way that I look at things, the, the way that I move through the world, um, even the way that I like speak and hold my body sometimes changes when I'm in man mode. And that cat does not, <laughs> does not like it, uh, does not like me on days when I'm feeling more like a guy, uh, but on days when I'm feeling more squishy or more like a woman. Um, that cat fucking loves me and it's it's very like it it totally changes i mean the hard thing about maladaptive daydreaming is like i've spent years and years constructing this world in my mind that's so elaborate that like honestly i don't even know everything about it um and it feels so much more real than the real world that like trying to live my day-to-day -day life is really hard because i just i want to go back into the world in my head it's much more real than the real world to me. Ah! I know, I ended up changing like five times today because like different activities I have to get into a different headspace for and like different things I require like a different mode and sometimes like what I'm wearing just isn't, isn't correct. Like it's not that it's wrong for the activity, it's just that the vibe's not correct for like who I need to be to be able to complete the task, you know? 
Oh, whoa, 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 sorry. Yeah, don't read that yet. Um, actually, I did want help on uh, the story that I'm writing, but um, <laughs> my handwriting is... <sighs> it is bad, but it's it, it's more that it's inconsistent. Um, it, trying to read my handwriting is really hard because it just fluctuates wildly the entire time I'm writing. Um, I like to write things out hand by hand first and, and then try and type them before anybody else reads them just just so they don't see that. Um, and then I get rid of the handwritten papers because I don't like looking at them for some reason. Oh yeah, no. Uh, I've been in theater since I was young. I've, I, I love theater. It's super easy for me. Um, getting into the headspace of being a completely different person is like second nature to me, really, honestly. It, it's almost like, it's almost like my mind, I have a harder time conceiving that I'm just one person in, in this world full of, you know, so many infinite possibilities in general, but just like so many infinite possibilities for the type of human that you could be and the type of life that you could live. And the fact that I could just be one person with one body just fundamentally doesn't make sense to my brain. So a chance to escape my current life and be somebody else is really welcomed. Um, the only problem about being in theater is like when I become the character, uh, like that's the, like I can only remember my lines when I'm in that character, you know, uh, and, and then after I and after the production is over, um, if I can't fully get into the character headspace, which I often can't because, you know, I don't have the practice spaces that I did anymore and there's not the costumes and the music and everything. Uh, I just told I can't remember any of my lines or like any of my experiences <laughs> from that play. Um, except for, except for general vibes, you know, so. I love theater, though. I love it. It's great. Thank you so much for letting me join your Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Uh, so I have a couple ideas for a character. So, um, this one is a character who, uh, is mute. They're a witch, and their familiar is actually going to speak for them, so it's almost like a, like a linked mind kind of situation. Um, where the two of them have to work together. Uh, alternatively, I have this character who is um, a warlock. Uh, they're a small child sometimes, but they also have the entity of like a powerful demon inside of them that's actually a big softy and like tries very hard to take care of the child. Um, I also have this character who, uh, so they're, they're a sorcerer and through a magical mishap when they were a child, um, ended up absorbing the souls of, um, you know, a whole classroom full of people. So now they have like the voices of all of these people in their head. Um, I, I, I have a whole bunch of ideas like this. I just, I love, I love characters who, uh, who are, um, just complex like that, you know? It's not that I, it's not that I don't remember, I guess. <sighs> okay, it, I know what happened. I just don't, like, remember it, it, it as it happened. It's, it's like somebody told me about it or like somebody wrote up like a, like a spark notes on the event and gave it to me. I'm aware of the events. And if you mention specifics, like I, I will be able to, you know, conjure vague ideas about what you're talking about, but I cannot visualize the, the memory whatsoever, nor can I access the feelings that I, I had in that moment. Um, sorry. No, because if it was DID, then I wouldn't ever be able to make the voices stop, right? And, like, sometimes when it gets really loud, um, if I, like, try really, really hard uh, to kind of suppress everything, or I just, like, mentally, like, scream really loud, um, sometimes I can make it stop uh, if I just shove it all down. So that can't be that. No, see, I'm just autistic, and I pick up other people's accents from hearing them sometimes, so sometimes I'm switching it out of it a little bit, and, like, certain accents just have, like, a strong vibe for me, and so that's why I feel like I should change my, my pronouns and my name when I'm, when I'm using a different accent, but, like, that doesn't, it, it's, 
Yeah, I brought it up in therapy once, um, and my therapist, uh, was like, oh, well, I don't really know much about DID, but I don't really know about that, um, and so I never brought it up again, and I don't think that's what it is. Yeah. My phone is buggy as hell. I don't know what it is, but, like, all of my social media platforms... My account will just like randomly follow and unfollow people and like randomly like and save stuff that I didn't like and save and it's, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody else seems to have this problem as much as I do. Also, it randomly deletes my posts sometimes. What the fuck? I have a compliment for all black women. Well, first of all, I love you so much. Second of all. So most white women would not be caught dead saying the things that she said in this video. And I'm about to psychoanalyze the fuck out of it because the tea is about to get hot. But first, I just want to thank the creator for being socially intelligent enough to compliment black women on their beauty and recognize it because most of the world does not do this, um, specifically white women. And let me tell you why. Y'all ready? So for a few years now, I've had this theory and I call it the Disney princess theory. From birth, white women have been told that they are the best thing since sliced bread. You see yourselves depicted in Disney movies as a beautiful princess with absolutely no flaws and deserving of being swept off your feet by a prince and basically bowed down to. Additionally, my best friend is a 43-year-old white woman from Canada. And one day she told me, as a child, her parents told her that she is better than black people, specifically black women, simply because she is white. If you didn't catch it in Disney movies and you weren't told it by your parents, your whole life you have subconsciously been programmed by media to believe that you are the most beautiful thing on this earth. So you grow up to have this air about you, like your shit don't stink. And um, it, it's constantly backed by society. Like, you know, because you're a white woman, you have a certain privilege and you are treated a certain way in society due to those things. Now let's talk about bullies. Um, when someone is insecure, they typically feel the need to bring someone down and they typically pick on the people who have something that they do not have. The person who is a constant reminder of the things that they wish that they were. And I bring up bullies because I was bullied by white women my whole childhood um, for having braids, um, like she talks about in the video, and for simply having a behind or rather a shape to my body that they did not have. So instead of complimenting me on it, they bullied me to the point where I starved myself as a child um, because they made me feel like I was ugly for simply being shaped like a black woman. This is what white women have continued to do throughout history and society when they see something that is not like themselves, they feel the need to tear it down and call it ugly. So unlike this woman who when she sees a beautiful black woman with goddess locks or braids, um, she compliments them, right? Y'all don't do that. And you don't do it not because you think that it's ugly. You, you truly don't think it's ugly. The problem is you actually think it's beautiful. Because what do we see constantly in society? These same white women that bullied me as a child have now grown up to get ass injections, lip injections. Um, you stay out in the sun all damn day long to try to look like me, black women, to try to look like us because you know it's beautiful. 
and you don't have those features naturally. So because you don't have those features naturally, and because everything that you have been taught since a child in that moment is being challenged, you see a beautiful black woman with a behind with beautiful brown skin that ages like fine wine with goddess locks and luscious full lips. And you don't know what to do with yourself. It challenges everything that you have been taught about yourself because you've been told you're the most beautiful. You've been told you're the most, you know, sought after. You're, you're what everyone wants. And then you see this beautiful black woman. And instead of complimenting her, you tell her that her braids are ghetto, that having a big butt is, ew, oh my God, ew. Why is her butt so big? You, you say and do all these things that are negative to try to make yourself feel better about what you see in the mirror that you actually don't like. This is why I absolutely commend that woman. For calling a spade a spade. Let's just say that. She knows it's beautiful and you do too. But your ego and privilege and all that you got going on inside of you that has been taught to you since birth does not allow you to say how you really feel. And that's why white women don't compliment black people or black women specifically on our features. But you go to the doctor to try to get them. Hmm. Hey, I'm going to hold your hand while I double, triple, and quadruple down on the fact that the 200 Republicans who are publicly endorsing Kamala Harris have had way more to do with Project 2025 and its success and its pervasion through American culture over the last 50 years than Donald Trump could ever take credit for. Okay? I know that we like to make Trump out to be this boogeyman who does all the bad things and is the root of all evil in the country, but he's not. He's not because he's not smart enough to be. He's dumb and he plays to a dumb audience. But that doesn't actually get shit done. That just helps win elections. You know what I mean? These people who are supporting Kamala Harris are deeply, deeply dangerous and insidious. They are the reason why Project 2025 is here, right? Project 2025 didn't just appear out of thin air, right? It's been in the works since the Reagan administration. And we have been shouting this from the rooftops that the Republicans are thick as thieves and they have this overarching idea of what they want the entire country to look like. You can't look at it state by state or county by county or town by town. It is a, a countrywide mission. And we have been shouting about this for decades. And we've been called, we've been called fucking conspiracy theorists. We've been told that we're just being insolent and that we're not, we're not, you know, we're not helping the cause because we have to work together with Republicans and meet them halfway and blah, 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 blah. Look where that's gotten us. Okay. So anyway, this whole point that I'm trying to make is that you cannot say you have to vote for Kamala because Donald Trump is going to do Project 2025 when Kamala is being publicly endorsed and her campaign team and the Democratic Party are wearing this endorsement as a badge of honor. She's being endorsed by the people who have literally authored Project 2025 and have helped push its agenda for 50 years. The people actually responsible for Project 2025 are the ones endorsing Kamala Harris. So you can't say both of those things at the same time. And this is not an endorsement of Trump. And if you've been here long enough, you know, I cut off my entire extended family in 2015 because they are Republicans, because of the way that they spoke about Black Lives Matter, because of the way that they endorsed Trump. Cold turkey, I cut them all the fuck off. I have not been to a single family function in a decade because this is how I roll, okay? So I don't want to hear like, oh, you know, you're just helping Trump win. The Democrats are helping Trump win. They are becoming Trump. They are becoming a smarter, more articulate version of Trump, which should scare you. Oh, I'm tougher on the border. I'm tougher on crime. That's not a good thing. 
You can't say that Trump is so dangerous and he's racist and then also clap at the woman who is saying that she's tougher on crime and tougher on the border. Who does that most negatively affect? Black and brown people. But it's racist when Trump does it, but not when the black woman does it. Please. You... And it's fine. It's fine if you feel like you have to vote for her because we are in this fucking ridiculous situation that nobody should ever have to be. So I get it, okay? I get it. But that doesn't necessarily make it true. Just because one seems better and feels better than the other doesn't actually mean that that person is better, okay? I get it. The one saying slurs, by default, the other one feels not as bad because they're not saying slurs on national TV. I get it. But you have to look at the bottom line. You have to look at the impact of what these people are doing. And the impact of both of these people is almost indistinguishable. They are almost identical. Okay? And that is a sad reality, but it is the reality. And so if you feel like you need to vote for her in November because you don't know what to do, and again, the one not saying slurs feels better to pick than the other one, I get it. And I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at people who are going to vote for Kamala in November because they just don't know what else the fuck to do. I get it. What angers me are the people who act like they are smarter and more pragmatic and more grown up than those of us who are going to vote third party or not vote at all. That's what makes me angry. This is not a common sense decision. Especially when there's a third party candidate who's on enough ballots in enough states to win over the electoral college. She's on the ballot in every swing state. So realistically, if we're going to talk about a viable candidate, there is a viable candidate. So you can't sit here and say that this is a common sense decision. It is not a common sense decision to vote for Kamala Harris. It's not. 200 Republicans endorsing her is bad. No matter which way you try to turn it, no matter which way you try to do any sort of gymnastics to understand it, it's bad. It's bad. Okay? And if you want to keep buying the bullshit that the Democrats are selling you, they are lying to your face. And if you want to keep buying it, that's on you. Okay? But don't act like you're fucking smarter than people because you're buying it. Because you've gaslit yourself into believing that the bullshit that you are buying is right. You're not. You're wrong. They are lying to you. They are bullshitting you every step of the way. And if you can't at least admit that, then we just will never have a a productive conversation. There's no conversation to be had. If you think that the Democrats do good and care about people, then we will never have a productive conversation. So yeah, anyway, I just wanted to remind you that um, Project 2025 is has everything to do with the Republicans endorsing Kamala Harris and has almost nothing to do with Donald Trump. Um, so, anyway. So here's the thing. Kamala is very obviously the pragmatic choice, right? And when I say that, I just want to clarify that I understand in a big picture way a long-term sense how the Democratic and Republican parties in this country are effectively the same. They both serve primarily to uphold the interests of the ruling class, to keep the masses docile, uh, and are both, admittedly at slightly varying paces, uh, pushing us further into the den of fascism, which we have already very solidly entered into at this point. However, uh, acting like in the shorter term, over the course of the next four years, there is literally no difference between Kamala and Trump, that there would be no advantages, uh, however marginal they might be, to Kamala being in office rather than Trump, uh, that is just reductive to the point of being nonsensical, right? So I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, Because the other thing, the main thing I want to talk about in this video is that uh, human beings are not perfectly rational, utilitarian, finely tuned decision making machines where you just put in all of the inputs of your current situation and reliably every time get the most pragmatic choice. Right. Uh, There's a lot of other things that go into the way we make decisions, like the way we feel about things our emotions, 
senses of loyalty uh, or betrayal or frustration, uh, all of these things, the, the breadth and depth of the human experience, you might say. And over the course of the last 11 months, um, most of us, uh, any of us who have not been just flat out turning a blind eye, have been experiencing to some degree or another uh, a live streamed genocide uh, that our government, the current administration, uh, is largely paying for and supplying. And this has affected uh, different people in different ways. Uh, some people, obviously, have been able to keep more distance from that, you know, uh, but others haven't, right? Other people uh, are feeling it much more viscerally. Uh, there are some people you may be shocked to hear in this country, on this app, who have family members, who have friends in Gaza, in Palestine, uh, who they are worried about losing, who they may have already lost. And for a lot of those people, putting a check next to Kamala's name on the ballot, even given that she's just the pragmatic choice, uh, that would feel like a betrayal of the people in Gaza who are experiencing this ongoing genocide right now. It will feel like a line in the sand that should not be crossed. Consequences be damned. And if that doesn't make sense to you, there was a really good video that Ismachi posted, I think the other week now, where they talked about how a big piece of this liberal urge to just get past Palestine, to stop critiquing Kamala for Gaza and just get on board, uh, a big piece of that is driven by the fact that a lot of people in the U.S., in the West generally, don't view the people in Gaza as real, full people. If you don't understand what I mean by that, I want you to imagine that the genocide is not happening on the other side of the world. Rather, it's happening in your neighborhood, in your city. The people uh, who are being killed are your friends, your family members, people that you know. I want you to visualize the, the face of the person that you care about most in this world and then imagine that they were just crushed under the rubble of a falling building just the other day, right? Really, really sit with that. Uh, that's what it feels like to, to experience the people that this is that this is happening to as full and real people. And I want you to sit in that place and really ask yourself, uh, in that place, do you feel like you would be able to go and put a check next to Kamala's name? She's still the pragmatic choice, but also you used to have a brother, a sister, a, a partner, a parent, and then they were crushed under, uh, under rubble and the very next day, you watch Kamala shake Netanyahu's hand and, and tell him that he has her full undying support, right? Now, maybe some of you are going to say that you would still be able to just uh, turn a blind eye, hold your nose, and, and vote for the pragmatic choice. But I'm guessing more of you, if you're really honest, are saying that you would not be able to do that, that that would feel, even in a small way, like signing off on on what is happening to those people that would feel like a betrayal of your loved ones the point of this video is not me telling you how to vote or how to not vote uh you should vote how you want to vote right and personally i do in a pragmatic sense uh hope that kamala wins right but what i do want to say to end this video is that the heart of fascism is getting people to ignore their humanity, to deride the humanity of others, to ignore the humanity of others uh, for the sake of control, for the sake of order, for the sake of fitting into systems regardless of how oppressive they are, regardless of the consequences of those systems. If you are coming on this app and seeing people express grief, frustration, outrage at what is happening right now and your response to that is to tell them to ignore those concerns that hey that doesn't matter don't don't worry about those human feelings you're having don't let those affect your decisions just be pragmatic just be rational that's all that matters there is a seed of fascism in there 
there is a seed of fascism in in that rhetoric that you should really, really introspect on and unpack before you open your mouth again. As of two days ago, Wednesday, September 11th, the state of Palestine has a seat among the other UN member states at the UN General Assembly. But what does that actually mean? Let's break it down. I've had a lot of people ask me this. If you're new here, my work takes me to the UN a lot. That's where a lot of our work happens. So I share what I know with y'all. The UN General Assembly is the main decision-making body of the UN. It's the body that includes all of the UN member states. That's 193 states. The room where they meet looks like this. And in addition to the 193 member states, there are also observers. Observers have the right to speak in these meetings and they can participate, but they can't vote on resolutions. They can't put forth resolutions. They can't make amendments. Permanent observers include some international organizations or regional organizations, and until recently, two states. One is the Holy See and the other was the state of Palestine. Holy See is like the government of the Vatican. Back in 2012, the state of Palestine was given non-member permanent observer status to the General Assembly, which means, like I said, they don't have a vote, so they're not able to vote on resolutions, they're not able to propose resolutions, but they can participate in the meetings and they have, you know, access to all the relevant documents, etc. Okay, so now they've been given a seat among the other member states. What does that mean? And also, why are they not a member state then? First thing to know, not all UN member states recognize the state of Palestine as a sovereign state, as a sovereign country. As of right now, though, 145 of the 193 UN member states do recognize Palestine as a sovereign state. And here's why that's important. Back in May of this year, the UN General Assembly voted to give the state of Palestine membership to make them a UN member state, like a full member state, not just observer status in the General Assembly. 143 states voted yes, 25 abstained, and just nine voted against this. Now here's the thing, the thing that's great about the General Assembly, especially because it's the main decision-making body of the UN, it's the one that includes all member states, it's basically majority rules, not pure majority, two thirds majority. But it means that no single state can just hold the rest of them hostage. But for a state to become a new member state of the United Nations, the Security Council has to recommend it as well. The US though, being the absolute pain in the butt that it is at the UN, and honestly, I would say kind of a villain, because the US doesn't recognize Palestinian statehood, they held up, they basically prevented the Security Council from being able to grant the state of Palestine, which again, they do not recognize, UN membership. The state of Palestine now being given this seat among the other UN member states, it's a huge reflection of the fact that the majority of UN member states recognize Palestine, want Palestine to be able to have full membership and sit there among them. It also means they now have the ability to introduce proposals. They can make amendments. They can't vote on resolutions yet in the General Assembly, but it's a big step towards membership. It's also yet another massive sign of growing global isolation of Israel. Israel and all its allies and to all states that do not recognize Palestine as a sovereign state. It's basically the majority of the member states of the UN saying, hey, okay, US, you can be the villain and try to block this from happening. We're still gonna keep pushing ahead and try to give this state, which we believe has rights to full membership of the UN, as much status and as much responsibility as we can. The thing that's so important to understand about the UN is that it's a forum. What is right? What isn't right? How should we conduct global affairs? And then it's up to all of those states and organizations and like even us individuals to go out and do that. The UN is just the place, like this institution where they gather and decide these things together. My colleague put it in such a good way that I think is so helpful to describe it. It's kind of like a boardroom where like the board meets. The boardroom doesn't do anything on its own. It can't like take any kind of action. Have that place and that structure where everyone meets and debates and talks and debates through things again and decides what to do. And then everyone leaves the boardroom and actually does the work. So yeah, I hope that was helpful. It's a big step that the majority of UN member states support, the vast majority, because they know what's right.